Okay, if you could, in your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. We are uh, reading the first verse. The title of the message this morning is called Choosing to Follow Jesus. So, here we go. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So, following God's commands is a choice. Every day we're faced with many, many choices. We can go with the program or look for advice from the world and a large cast of characters in the media uh, or the political sphere, people like Oprah or Dr. Phil um, or Ben Affleck and his, his band of self-righteous knucklehead actors. Um, <laughs> this also includes like Elizabeth Warren, the Obamas, the Trumps, all of them. Uh, and, and also the comedy guys like Bill Maher and uh, Saturday Night Live and all these other folks who uh, are under the, the category of comedy, but really it's a lot of political commentary. And I, I've discovered as I talk to people that most folks get their news that way and they believe what they're, they're seeing. And it's because it's, it's spoken with this weird fake authority. And it, the reality is none of those people actually love you. Uh, they don't love us or have our best interests at heart. Instead, um, we can and should seek guidance from the Almighty, who sacrificed himself for us, as we were reminded last week on Resurrection Sunday. So let's reflect for a moment on what sacrificial agape love looks like. Jesus didn't need to leave heaven, a place with no pain, no tears. He was in an all-powerful state, and he chose out of love for each one of us to come down as a frail human, and he spent his time here teaching us his ways, using his word and his actions. You know, he, he lived it out right in front of us. He endured tremendous hate and physical pain, and all of this culminates in his greatest earthly achievement, which he took all of our past our present, and our future sins upon himself at the cross. And all of these things he chose to do. So this is the finest and best example of agape or sacrificial love that we'll ever find. So if you could please turn to Matthew 26, um, or if you want to read off of there, it's a little bit small. But uh, Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So Jesus had chosen to do the Father's will. And... Uh, he clearly knew what it was going to cost. And his flesh was most likely in tremendous fear since we know that he cried tears of blood. Um, however, 
he also knew the great rewards and blessings to come for all of us, and he chose to save us anyway. So let's go back to Romans 12.1 and learn from his commands to us so we can, we can learn to make the same kinds of choices. Um, as we're looking at verse 1, it's important to understand where we are in this letter of Paul to the Roman church. To begin, the book of Romans has a very high place in Scripture because of its tremendous detail on God's great plan of redemption. It's been called the most complete theological and systematic book of the New Testament. Oh, that's Chuck Missler. Um, we also have um, some comments from Martin Luther, who praised the book of Romans and said, it is the chief part of the New Testament and the perfect gospel. John Calvin, a Swiss theologian, said, when anyone understands this epistle, he has a passage open to him to the understanding of the whole scripture. Many of you may also be familiar with the tried and true Romans Road method of sharing and teaching the essentials of our faith to a new believer, which focuses on many of the key scriptures in the book of Romans to gain a firm foundation in the faith. The life of the Apostle Paul is documented in Acts chapter 8 through 28, as well as in Galatians 1 and 2 and 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. We won't cover his life story uh, and, and all the things that happened there, but it's pretty clear to most historians that Paul wrote this letter while in Corinth during his third missionary journey around AD 57. Um, Paul knows some of the folks in the Roman church personally, and many of these he spent a lot of time with and sent them on ahead. They're mostly Gentiles with a handful of Jewish believers in the mix as well, and we get to learn many of their names in chapter 16, another chapter that we should definitely chew on at some point. I'll leave that for you guys later on this afternoon. So as we start to dig deeper into chapter 12 specifically, we find ourselves at the beginning of Paul's Guide to Christian Living, um, which includes chapter 12, goes all the way through chapter 15, verse 13. And you can see when you read the last verse of chapter 11, um, you know that Paul's kind of ending that section. He ends with the word amen, kind of like the end of a sermon. And then uh, he's starting something new. And that's really what we're, we're in right here. This is the first verse of the guide to how we should live. And that's why it's very important. So in this first sentence, we find... This is back to Romans 12, 1. We find the word beseech or urge, depending on which version of the Bible that you have, uh, which translation. Uh, this word comes from the root word in Greek, parakaleo, which means to call near or invite in order to help or give aid. Let's see here. It can also be, mean, it can also be used to mean exhorting, admonishing, or encouraging. And, uh, and Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the parakletos, our divine helper in John 14, 16. So here Paul's speaking as a human helper, though, um, but his command carries the full weight of being uh, coming from an apostle who speaks the inspired word of God. With that said, it's a gentle command, and it's a gentle command that can only be obeyed by a believer. How do we know that? We know that because it says the word brethren in that, in that sentence. And for this, you've got to apply, uh, for this statement to apply, you've got to be part of God's family. And as it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So again, this is, this is a verse that isn't going to make any sense to a non-believer. Um, frequently when, when counseling someone, or uh, in particular when speaking to an unequally yoked couple, we run into a problem. And uh, the problem when you have someone who doesn't know the Lord, um, when, when I'm trying to help them, or any of us is trying to help them, uh, and I try to explain it this way, there's a there's a wall of problems, and all the solutions are on the other side, and Jesus is the door. And if you're not willing to go through the door, there's no access to those solutions. And uh, sometimes all we can do for a person like that is give them the gospel message. 
because uh, if they're not a believer, they don't have the helper. They don't have the parakletos. And the wisdom of God is restrained in their life. They don't really have access to it. And so there's many times where all we can do is pray for our friends and loved ones who aren't yet in a relationship with Jesus. Frustration can, can arise when we wonder why it is that what seems so obvious and clear to us is not getting through to those who we're trying to reach. And uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, explain why this is the case. It says there in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, But even if our gospel is veiled... It is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Throughout this entire week, God's been uh, speaking to me in the middle of so many situations. And uh, my son is in this situation. And uh, it's been... It's been very apparent to me that the main thing I can do with him is pray. And if I get a chance to speak, it's just to speak the gospel because everything else that I might want to tell him, and there's plenty, uh, as his father... (laughs) Um, This stuff hit home all week long. So right now, let's let's all just pause and pray for our family, our friends, our prodigals, really for anyone who's in this blinded state, and I'm sure every one of us knows somebody who's been blinded. So let's pray. Father, we come to you with a very humble heart. And Lord, we do ask that you, you remove the blinders. You remove whatever the enemy's doing to prevent those that we love from knowing you. We ask that you do a miracle. Lord, show yourself to them in a way that they understand. Do not let them perish, Father. In Jesus' name. Sorry. It's been a tough week, like I said. I was better first service. <laughs> okay. Continuing on in Romans 12:1, we see a short part between two commas, and it says in there, "By the mercies of God." And Paul puts that there to remind us of why the choice he's telling us to make is a reasonable thing. And it's because of God's great mercies toward us. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's Ephesians 1.3. We've also been shown in great detail each of his mercies and his love and grace throughout all the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. So I'm going to give you a fast forward of those 11 chapters. <laughs> we are loved. Romans 1.7. We are beloved of God and called to be saints. And Romans 8, 38, moving on after that too. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
we are loved indeed. There's no room in that, that statement, that verse, for anything. We cannot get DQ'd. He loves us, no matter what. That's awesome. Next, we have received grace. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 2 through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And Romans 5, 20 and 21, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Another one of those guaranteed things. And it's also something that we don't really understand. You know, grace, which covers everything we've done, and even more importantly, everything we're going to do. Only a God that's outside of time could create something like grace and, and, and make it happen. It's a, I still don't really understand it. I don't know if any of us ever will. <laughs> this one is awesome, too. We are his sons and daughters. So Romans 8, verse 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. (laughs) For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Hmm. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. How awesome is that? Right? We are, we're seeing something that only uh, a triune God could do, to be our father and at the same time be a brother to the son, as it says right here. We are also heirs just like him. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Amazing. And so, more of these tremendous promises. We have been given the Holy Spirit. Still in Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Tough one right there. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So all of these things are what compels us into the following words of verse 1. And... uh, Those are the ones that are highlighted in there. That we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So this is all about choice, to choose to serve and obey God. There's also some other key words in Romans 12.1 that further illustrate what the service should look like. To be holy, set apart for his use. To be acceptable, pleasing to him. Think about that sometimes when I'm laying around watching a hockey game, if I'm being pleasing to him. Most likely not. (laughs) Which is our reasonable service. And it's really the only, you know, rational thing that we could respond to all of this that we've we've just heard and read. This is what we should be doing. It, it's crystal clear. And the word reasonable there is logikos in the Greek, and it means of the word or according to the word. And uh, I was thinking to myself, well, why is that? And it's because the word is just all truth right here. And that reasonable service, it is, it is nothing but reasonable. Everything that we see in here is all straight from him. And that's why that word makes sense there. 
I, I spent a little time chewing on that one. <laughs> and lastly, let's look at Romans 6.13. Um, you don't have to flip if you don't want to, because I did get this one big enough. Um, and this gives us additional insight into our service unto the Lord. It says here, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So today's society is based on feelings. Um, we, uh, what, whatever people feel today is right. I'll, I'll give some examples of, of things like this. You know, nobody really wants to forgive somebody who harms them. And so uh, I hear this kind of thing a lot, and it's even come out of my own mouth at one point or another. I'll forgive my friend, brother, father, fill in the blank, when it feels right. Or, we'll get married when it feels right, when it feels like the right time. I've heard that one a few times also. And uh, here's another one. I'm not sure I'm ready to serve at the church. I'll let you know when I feel I've been called. <laughs> um, listening to Pastor's Perspective the other day, I heard a news report about a woman who got arrested for walking around naked somewhere... I believe, in Southern California. Um, she, <laughs> she was soaking wet and, uh, and had apparently been swimming. And uh, when she got arrested, she told the police that she felt that she was a mermaid. <laughs> um, we're in a ridiculous time right now where a young man can feel like a girl and our society says it's okay and that he can use the women's restroom. Um, all of these examples are society's way of doing things. However, the Bible tells us to choose first, to choose to forgive, to serve, and to love. Forgiven and forgiving. Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to, up to 70 times seven. That's really an unlimited number. It's, I think, the point he's making. That's definitely one of the things we need to choose to do. Serving. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, we, we have these words, and they're in lots of other places too. We also have Jesus' example in, in many cases. Obviously, on the cross, all of those things. But we have that awesome example in the up, upper room um, after the Last Supper. And uh, they get done eating, and Jesus slaps a towel on and gets down with a basin and washes the feet of the guys in the room. This was the job of the lowest servant in the house. And that's what Jesus did. And so we have plenty of action from him to show us the way to go, to show us the road. And he chose to do that. I mean, here is the creator of the universe washing feet, dirty feet. Those guys, mostly like me, wore sandals a lot of the time, you know. <laughs> and those roads were not paved. Um, it's, just a, it's just awesome to think about that because he's doing that for us too. He washes us with his word. He takes the time to do that because he cares. And that leads us right to love. Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. 
So as we honestly think about choices, we don't receive any blessings until we've chosen to follow his guidance. For example, I've never actually wanted to forgive someone who's hurt me. Um, Honestly, none of us really want to forgive. It's only after lots of prayer and guidance from the Lord that we choose to forgive. And then God rewards us with the good feelings that come from that repentance and reconciliation. These times of forgiveness begin with asking him to forgive us first and then following that up with the other person. Um, We see a good model for this with David when he gets called out by the prophet Nathan after sinning with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 12. We see his request for forgiveness in Psalm 51. And uh, it's, it's really, I, let's read it together because it's, it's awesome. So please do turn to Psalm 51 in your Bibles. And even the title of it really lays it out for us. To the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And it starts in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Lord, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. We'll stop there. The reason why what David did here is the right approach is explained for us in Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have or receive mercy. It's the same thing with serving unto the Lord, either at church or wherever we happen to be. It's never about wanting to serve others because we're all kind of inherently selfish, lazy, and wicked. It's only after we choose to serve that the blessings come. And they do. God is so gracious to give us those rewards when we help somebody uh, or when we serve at the church. I've, I've told a few of this before. You know, I never regret getting in the car to come here because I'm always excited to see what's going to happen, excited about what opportunity I'll get to do, whatever it is. And uh, it absolutely is a reward that I get now. And I know 
You know, those crowns aren't in heaven. I may be getting a pat on the back now, but I do like it. <laughs> I'm sure we all do. Um, I ask the Lord in prayer for those pats on the back, not just for myself, or, but for other people too, often because we, we do need encouragement every once in a while. This also carries into our relationships with one another, especially in a marriage. Just as Jesus chose to love us in spite of our overwhelming hatefulness and rejection of him, we have to choose to love one another. And I'm not talking about the hot flash, eros type of love, which is uh, an emotional thing based on, you know, feelings. As we learned earlier, that's the world's definition of love. The only type of love that is a choice is agape love, and that's the greatest love of all. And uh, that's what we should be seeking to emulate. So um, let's look at Ephesians 5. Um, it's verse 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So, Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. All those blessings of marriage that he gives us come after we've made that choice of agape, sacrificial love. What does this mean in, in actual practice, in real life? It means looking past the little things that bother us and uh, seeing our spouse with his eyes. Um, it's choosing to love our spouse no matter what happens through, truly, through any trial or sacrifice that's required of us. Um, I, I know of many in our church uh, included that uh, you'll have one person who's sick for days, weeks, months, even years at a time and to watch that faithful service of the other. Um, I was talking to Miss Audrey Owens um, just yesterday and uh, she just happened, again, I'm sure the Lord appointed this conversation. She was telling me during her time of chemotherapy when she was really, really sick, how Kevin would come home after a 12-hour day exhausted, but he was going around the house doing all the little things that she normally did. That's agape love. That's sacrificial. Because the selfish thing to do when you're coming home and you're tired is I want to sit back in the easy chair. I'm going to kick my shoes off and drink a Coke or whatever. And, and just do nothing. And yet, the sacrificial role, the agape role, is to do the things he did. And that's what it looks like in real life. Choosing to love our spouse no matter what happens. And really, it means to live out 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I don't remember if I have a slide for it. I don't. 1 Corinthians 13 um, if we could turn there together and read it. Um, we're going to read through just as it is in the scripture, but later on, insert your name wherever you see the word love, and that will help you understand what this looks like um, within your own life, within your own marriage. So we'll start 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, and it's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely and doesn't seek its own. Love is not provoked and thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things and believes all things hopes all things, and endures all things. 
love never fails. So, as we leave here today, recognizing the choices that we get to make all day, um, let's remember what, what we see here in the scriptures, the guidance that we have, and help us to choose, you know, the right choices to follow Jesus in each one of these places. Okay? Let us choose to be living sacrifices. All right. Let's close in prayer. Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning asking you that you create in us a clean heart, Lord. And Lord, we do ask also that you give us wisdom in each and every moment when we have to make a choice, a choice to follow you, Lord, and to do as you would, Lord. Help us to make those choices each and every day, Lord. We are weak without you, Father. We ask that you give us an overwhelming measure of the Holy Spirit within us during each of those tough moments, Lord. Let it be obvious to everyone that we've been spending time with you